Impact Wrestling fans, what's going on? BQ here with Ro the Great. This is the Impact Lounge. Please hit subscribe, regardless of whatever platform you're on. If you're already a subscriber on YouTube, why don't you go subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. If you listen to us streaming there, maybe come over to the YouTube side. Check out the Impact Lounge. It is the place to be. We're talking Slammiversary 2018, one of the best Impact TNA pay-per-views in a long time. One of the best pay-per-views in wrestling. Ro, what do you got on, what What do you grade Slammiversary on a scale to 10? What did you give it last night? I gave it a nine. Um, I've been consistent with it. I think Slammiversary is their premiere show. I know Bound for Glory is the one they kind of push to be kind of like that flagship show. But yeah, I gave it a nine out of 10. It was just flawless. And you know what? It's what, it, uh, it's what I fully expected I felt that Redemption was the pay-per-view that they really kind of did do on. I fully expected them to deliver, and they did that with Slammiversary. Yeah, Redemption was, was we talked about this texting, more of a B-level show. You know what I mean? It was just, they didn't really swing for the fences of Redemption. I think the goal was just to put on a good wrestling pay-per-view, and they, they did that. This time, they took it to the next level, and I'm in agreement with you. I know that they say Bound for Glory is, you know, the show, but Slammiversary is typically better than Bound for Glory. At least it has been for the last several years. I think, you know, I think it's just the middle of the year. They're more focused, more motivated to put on a good show because in the last quarter of the year, regardless of what business you're in, the re- last quarter of the year is always the down quarter, and I just feel like they go into Bound for Glory not as, uh, not as motivated. But yeah, yeah, but yeah, this show was uh this show was killer. Let's let's get into it. Let's just start breaking down the matches one by one. Opener for this thing was the four way. So Rich Swan was not available, suffered a concussion at MLW. It's crazy that Impact let let's talk about this real quick. Um it's crazy that Impact had people and I, I understand they're not trying to stop their money, but had wrestlers competing this close to a pay-per-view go back to last year bound for glory it wasn't last year i'm sorry two years ago the grand championship finals was supposed to be drew galloway and aaron rex drew galloway gets hurt aaron rex goes on to take on eddie edwards and there was a tournament to decide those two guys so fast forward to now rich swan who i think is the i think he's gonna be a standard bear for the x division i think he's the guy that's like we watch him, and we were we're reminded of what the X division was. That's that's my thing with him. But he he was out. Um, but what do you think about that? About them competing so close? Because I think Sue Young even wrestled the the Saturday before. I mean, there were people on this card wrestling the day before Slammiversary. I think in the case of uh, Rich Swan, I wouldn't have too much of a problem with it because you think about it, he barely just got on board. So you know, you give him a pass. But even you know, you, now that you mentioned with when we had the grand uh, title tournament and having somebody like Drew who had been on the roster for some time, I, I, I know that Impact, what they're trying to do now, they really don't want to stop the wrestlers from working shows, but they got to look at, you know, the from their point of view as well, you know, they're getting ready to put on a, a pay-per-view and you have people advertise, you need them there. The best of ability is availability. So I think that's just something that they might have to restructure down the road. Yeah, and uh, he got injured wrestling for MLW. From what I understand, they have several Impact stars on their shows, but Impact's not allowed to use their stars. So, you know, it, it's weird that you would just allow him to work. But I guess Rich Swan is not a contracted wrestler for Impact. You know, he's doing per date, so maybe they don't have control over it. I don't know, but the replacement was Petey Williams. A lot of people were plugging for Desmond Xavier, but Petey Williams makes sense. I mean, it's in Canada. They let him come out first, got the uh, the huge ovation. So it was Petey Williams, Johnny Impact, Phoenix, and uh, Taji Ishimori. Did this meet your expectations for what you expected? I think it would have been better with Swan, but it was still really entertaining for me. What would you think? Yeah, same thing. Um, I think in these t- particular type of matches, <clears throat> excuse me, even though I would have loved to see Swan, there people are kind of in, some of the participants are interchangeable because it's really designed to kind of 
get the crowd excited, looking forward to the show. With that said, and as we move forward, I think sometimes when they put these matches on first, it really sets the bar high, and then it's the next set of matches kind of have to level up. And sometimes that's not as easy as, you know, it'd like us uh, to believe. But, yeah, with this said, um, I like that they teased us. There was points in this match where I actually thought Phoenix was going to win. And uh, um, obviously Johnny Impact gets the W, as I suspected. But, yeah, overall, this is a great uh, opener. They definitely made uh, Johnny Impact, uh, st- well, by winning he stood out, but they definitely made Phoenix stand out. How did you do on your predictions? Uh, how many ma- uh, matches did you miss? Three. I went five and three. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, I, went, I went seven for eight. Um, what three did you miss? Moose, Su Young, and uh, the Cage. Okay. Uh, yeah, I just I I, uh, I took the OGs, but at the time we were reviewing the show, we were under the impression it was a non-title match. So had I known it was a title match. I would have said LAX, but I, I stuck with my original guess even when they said it was a title match. But, um, yeah, match was excellent. They they played up to the crowd. The crowd was really, really hot for it. They were pretty much hot for the entire show. And it did what it was designed to do, get everyone excited, fired up. And, you know, there's the rumors, not the rumors, not official rumors by any stretch, but some fans saying, I think uh, the Bullet Club is going to show up during this. And I think... Uh, Killer Cross is going to show up and attack PD Williams during the match. Like no one's, no one's coming out during the opener, especially when it's like an X division style match that's designed to get the crowd going. We're not going to see an overbooked finish for something like that. But uh, they did excellent. And would you say that you know Phoenix was kind of the all star here? Yeah, he showed me something because I, you know, normally you think about when we get these matches, a lot of times they use it, it's uh, Arrow Star, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, but Phoenix, man, I I hope that they, you know, decide to keep him in because since we've seen him on board, I know a lot of times since he's a uh, is he real life brothers with Pentagon or is that just something yeah, that they play? Life. Yeah. OK. You know, we just seen that that alliance. So I'd really like to see him mix it up in the X Division a little bit more because he showed me some stuff. Very impressive. Yeah, I hope we see him more. And I was really under the, under the impression for a long time that guys like him, Pentagon, you know, that they were like lo- on rental, you know. But then, but then you think about it because you know some of the the haters like to say, well, half of your roster is from Lucha Underground. Like Lucha Underground isn't even a wrestling promotion; it's a TV show that you know maybe records a couple weeks out of the year. They didn't record it, uh, do television at all last year, as far as new television. So, yeah, granted, it's something that you know runs for a season, but. That's not Lucha Underground is not a full time job. Like that's not a full time wrestling promotion. So um, I think when we see guys come over like Pentagon and stuff, I, I think they're going to be remaining on the roster. I don't think it's like a, a rental for two sets of tapings and then they head back. But uh, we'll see. We will see going forward. Um, but yeah, this was excellent. Did what it was designed to do. And uh, I think we just going through this match, you just knew we were going to get. A great pay-per-view. So after this match, second match on the card was Allie versus Tessa Blanchard. Allie comes out debuting a new ring gear, which I think was really necessary. The uh, the pink bunny one wasn't going to fly anymore. And then she kind of came out recently almost looking like street clothes a little bit. She had the, the uh, Allie t-shirt on and, and black jeans. And I, I kind of figured that's what she was going to do for a while. But this was a good opportunity for her to debut some new ring gear, and I think it will work going forward. I liked it. I think she looked good. Um, Tessa Blanchard looked good. Um, what did you think of this one? So I want to say, as I was watching this, I think if we were to watch it a second time, we'd probably appreciate it more than the first time. And you know, hopefully the IWC didn't ride Alley too hard on this because obviously Tessa Blanchard, um, I'm going to say she's a bigger name. You know, granted, uh, doing the May Young thing and just for her her background and everything, even though she's been in the industry a lot less, but she, you know, she's she's uh, one of the biggest stars, upcoming stars. I hope the IWC didn't ride Ally too hard here. Uh, she it started off sloppy, and this is the first time these two have wrestled. I'm pretty sure ever, so I'm sure there was a little bit of uh, getting to know each other, you could say, to kick off the match. And overall, I had thought um, I thought the match ended really well. I just think it started off a little slow, but 
if you look at the girls' expressions at the very end, they were smoked. They were tired. They they did beat the crap out of each other. Um, Tessa suplexing Allie or doing the front suplex onto the railing. I mean, they they took some chances. The Alley Valley driver on the outside, and uh, there was the Huracarana from the top rope. We've never seen Allie take a move like that before. She landed on her head. I hope she's okay. Uh, it looked very ugly. There was a couple ugly spots, and it, it seems like the last few Impact pay-per-views, there's always <laughs> a, a good handful of botches. Um, you know, people are trying to take it to the next level, and and uh, sometimes it doesn't work out. But it's probably been like that a, a good like four pay-per-views in a row. But I thought overall the match was better. I think we would appreciate it more watching it the second time around. So what do you got on this match, Ali versus Tessa? I, the first thing I want to say, I thought, and you tell me, I thought this would have been better served to go on as the opening match and then have the uh, Fatal 4-Way, only because I felt that the uh, Fatal 4-Way kind of set the tone, and you kind of knew whatever was following up, because this, this was just mainly just a, a one-on-one match, a grudge match, you want to say, because they didn't, it wasn't really like a heated feud. They really started uh, interacting with each other a couple weeks ago, but as far as the match, it seemed like it started to pick up towards the middle and towards the end. Um, you know, credit to Impact for not limiting, I, I don't even want to say the women, anybody on the roster, giving them that freedom to, you, you know, go out there and, you know, put all the stops because normally when when you think about it in other promotions, you might not see. And that Rana, that Rana that Tessa did, was that intended for her to do like a spike? Or it was just, it was a botch? What, what do you think? I don't think that was intended to be a spike. That's way too dangerous. Oh, okay. All right. It, like, because that's what, at first I thought it was a botch, but then I thought maybe she was doing a spike. But... And, you know, once again, too, there was a uh, that sequence where when Ali hit her, the super kick and I thought that was like, wow, they're really going to let Tessa lose <laughs> yeah, again. I thought the, the same. Third time in a row. But they really did good. And I, I think the loss doesn't hurt Ali, obviously. Um, now we get to see Tessa move on to bigger and better things. One would assume she's going to try to put her hat in to try to challenge for the knockouts title. But I thought the goal was just to give Tessa a strong win on her pay-per-view debut, and uh, Impact was able to do that. I think Allie, when she took the Rana, held onto her ankles too long. And I think uh, that's what spiked her into the ground. Because I kind of noticed when she was getting ready to take the move, I was like, man, Allie's really locked in. She held on for dear life, it looked like. When I say that we could go back and probably appreciate this a second time around, I think... We knew what to expect with the opener. And then when this match came around, um, I think us hardcore fans were very like, okay, we, you know, we're almost watching the pay-per-view nervously. You know, what are, what, what is the, uh, what's the Meltzer's thinking and what's the Bubba Ray's thinking? And some people don't give a shit about that stuff, but I'm, I've been very, (laughs) what's that? You don't give a shit. Yeah, but, but I have, you know, I'm very strong in my point to say that these influencers, whether it's the web- websites or podcasters, until they buy in, you know, these people who are not watching the company are not going to buy into. There's only so much we can do as fans, uh, but these people have to spread the word that it's a it's a good product. So I guess I was watching it kind of uh, nervously, and you're you're looking for everything to be perfect and everything to be crisp. And now that the pay per view's over and you know that it was an outstanding pay per view, maybe we go back and say, okay, that was a really good knockouts match but i agree it picked up in the middle and uh the end was really good as well i thought the same ali hit the super kick and i thought it was over um and when she hit the uh code breaker you know tessa rolled out of the ring so uh at first when she hit that i was like oh god you know um i like ali better but you know the tessa if we're talking from a um you know just a, a booking standpoint and we're not experts at that you know tessa needed this win and ali it doesn't hurt ali uh anything else on that knockout encounter i think the only thing you could probably say or at least what i'd say is it kind of sucks like the way and i understand because during the time they didn't have tessa sign you would have kind of liked to see maybe tessa versus ali as that being tessa's second match so like maybe she had feuded with someone before facing ali versus it being the fir- her first but yeah it, it gave tessa a strong win um, i'm interested to see which way they go with ali now uh, I, I like that. It seems like they changed her character a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see what direction they ha- they go with her moving forward. And as I've said before, they, they need to add some new knockouts because if you look at the website, you know, there's a decent amount of knockouts 
but uh, several of them cannot compete <laughs> or they're <laughs> not competing for whatever reason. You know, like Diamante's an example. You know, she's, I think she's cleared now, but, you know, what is she doing? I think she did wrestle on Explosion. It just hasn't come out yet. I'm uh, pretty certain of it because I saw a picture online. Uh, and I, I thought it said explosion in the background, um, but I, I was pretty sure it was a Diamante match, not LAX. So we will see. But I, I'm I'm in agreement. It's interesting to see what they do with Ali going forward. I guess you got to be careful with Tessa because you don't want to throw her at the knockouts title picture too soon. But I, at the same time, do you do a Tessa versus Sue Young angle? I don't, I don't really think so. And that's why. And I've repeated myself a hundred times on this. That's why I really thought the doing a Legend Killer style. Uh, gimmick with with Tessa Blanchard for a little while would have given her something to do and the matches would have mattered but they got they need to stack up the uh, knockouts roster a little bit better um, and it seems like she's never going to get her redemption against Madison Rain so we'll get to that a little bit later third match on the card Eddie Edwards took on Tommy Dreamer in a House of Hardcore match so halfway through this match on Fight TV on the app, people were saying this pay-per-view is wasted my money. This is bullshit. Da, 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 da. Now, the opener was good. People were very indifferent on the second match. And then the third one, I actually did not like this match. This, this was probably the one match on the card that uh, when I w go back to watch a pay-per-view again, maybe I'll have a different evaluation of it. I didn't care for this. I thought it was um kind of hokey. I thought it was safe. I thought it was PG. Um... When you got guys like Sammy Callahan really bleeding later in the show, and you've got Eddie Edwards from what I assume was fake blood, which normally I don't care about that. I I'm, let me say that I'm not some Mark that's oh he used Kool Aid he did this and this. I really don't give a shit. It's wrestling. Wrestling is not real. But if you're gonna go all in later in the show with the physicality, why are we playing it so safe with this match here? I thought the spot with Tommy Dreamer hitting him with the ECW belt and then uh, hitting him with a drink a little bit before that, I really popped for those. I thought that was good. You know, kind of popped for the staple gun thing and uh, then realized it wasn't really real. But, you know, what is? It's wrestling. But overall, I, I just thought the match was safe. I thought this was nothing different than we would see on an episode of Impact. And Eddie is the guy. I cannot wait to see what the hell they do with him going forward because... With the finish of this match, I liked the finish. It was flat, but I liked the idea of it. Um, Don Callis had no clue what that move was called. And it just <laughs> it, the commentary was really awkward when he hit the uh, Boston knee party with the chair. But there was the flaming table, and it was... it was. Uh, why even do it? I shouldn't even call it a flaming table. I should call it a table that had some lighter fluid on it. You know, they teased it, but this is Impact. This isn't WWE. Light the damn thing on fire. You know, at least give us the um, the impression that maybe someone is going through it. But I just went into this thinking, okay, someone's going to bleed. You know, we, we seen last time Eddie wrestled, Sammy bled a lot. He wrestled Tommy Dreamer in hard, House of Hardcore. He bled a lot. So you're thinking this one is just going to be balls of the wall. And they could have done, they could have gone so many different directions when with, with Eddie. So Eddie wins the match, which I thought he would. And then... Afterwards, there's the awkward handshake segment and Alicia comes down and, and, you know, they could have, I thought Alicia looked amazing by the way, but you know, Alicia could have helped Eddie, turned on Eddie, um, pretended to help dreamer and then turned on him or, or there was just so many different things they could have done rather than, Hey, Alicia, go out there, make him, make him shake his hand. Uh, and then they tease after that Tommy Dreamer is going to go after him. And then he gives them the kendo stick. So they did a passing of the torch. And as Eddie Edwards held that kendo stick, I know I'm rambling on for a long time here. As he held that kendo stick, all I could see was the old Eddie Edwards back. I didn't see, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? I didn't see the crazy deranged dude. Um, he looked like a guy whose who's itch was scratched. You know, he, it, it wasn't Eddie, it wasn't um, Sammy Callahan. It was... Tommy Dreamer, someone who was just in the way, and he looked like he just went back to the old Eddie. And I think I, I like where they're going with Eddie, but I think they should just add some edge to him, not like the whole trying to make him crazy. Cause he just he just sounds he just he almost sounds like he's trying too hard. You know, I, I just I just want him to have a little more edge to him instead of trying to 
sound deranged because we just know he's not, you know. Um, so yeah, I rambled on long about that one, but uh, I just I stand by the fact that I really just didn't care for it. What do you uh, what did you think about the House of Hardcore match? You know, once again, I think following up the Tess and Alley match, I kind of felt like maybe they should have done another match or had a segment. Because that was the one thing where I was surprised about this whole pay-per-view. We didn't have any type of segments. And no Eli Drake, too. So I thought maybe they could have had a segment before having this match. With that said, I feel it was okay. But I felt like they held back a lot. I thought this feud as it was... It wasn't really like a blood feud because you think about it, all it stemmed from was Tommy Dreamer trying to hold Eddie Edwards back from, you know, trying to murder Sammy Callahan. So then he ends up attacking Dreamer and then accusing Dreamer of messing with Alicia. So then that's where they start fighting. I, I felt like this was one of these matches where they needed to do something like brutal. Like it needed to be a hard, a serious hardcore match. I felt like, like you were saying, a lot of the stuff was safe. And then the tease with the flaming table, I think to not do it, to not utilize it in the match. And then even after post-match, I thought if they really wanted to go like, go the route that I thought they were going with Eddie, I would have had Eddie, you know, shake Tommy Dreamer's hand, low blow him and then put him through the flaming table. But they didn't do that. Instead, you have Alicia come down, say it's over, and then Eddie teases like he's an attack Dreamer, but he doesn't. They shake, and then Dreamer gives him the kendo stick. It does have me worried about where do they, do they go with Eddie. Like, I, I feel, because, you know, he doesn't, it doesn't come across as he's going to be this deranged Eddie Edwards now. He, he's gotten his uh, revenge, so to speak. So what's next for him? And, and I, I just worry well, if he'll be miscasted. I feel like they... Undid. I see what they tried to do. They tried to pass the torch as the next innovator of hardcore, whatever the hell it called, Tommy Dreamer. Uh, but I feel like, for me as a viewer, I felt like they undid months of storyline. You know, compare the way Eddie left Slammiversary compared to the way Sammy Callahan left Slammiversary. Compare their matches. These are two guys that you want to have on a collision course with each other, probably again later. Their matches should have been on equal footing, you know. And I, I get it. The House of Hardcore was earlier in the show. You know, if you know the story of MC Hammer when he was coming up, he used to open for artists, but he always went harder than the closing artist. And um, this was before he was really discovered. They used to tell him, you have to tone it down. You can't outdo the, the closing act. Um, so I get it. This is the third match on the card. You probably can't put it on par with, with what happened, but... I just I just felt like Eddie left a really hokey, okay, safe match, and then Sammy Callahan left one of the best matches I've ever seen before. So I'm I can't wait to see what they do with uh, Eddie going forward. What match you got next? I'm going off memory. Uh, I believe was it the X Division? I think so. That's what I was gonna say. I, I believe I believe so, and that's when really because and that, like like you were saying too, and I'll admit. You know, after the the Eddie Edwards and Tommy Dreamer House of Hardcore, I was kind of worried because I was like, man, these re the rest of these matches need to deliver, or the the pay per view is gonna kind of fall flat. Because we've seen in the past where you know the opener, some sort of X Division style match that always gets everything going, and then it just falls. But I really feel like from the X Division match, then moving forward, well, the title match, I should say, to moving forward. Everything, it, it, it uh, helped the card, I, I should say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, a pay-per-view is, is mainly remembered by the last match. And sometimes when the last match is excellent, you say, damn, that was a good pay-per-view. This ended with three amazing matches, uh, which, which caused people to say, yeah, fucking phenomenal pay-per-view. But Brian Cage versus Matt Seidel... Uh, to me, there was no doubt in my mind that Brian Cage was winning. I know you picked Matt Seidel. There were several near falls in this match that they weren't crisp, but uh, they, they, they went for some really, really good innovative spots. And there was times where Matt Seidel looked like he was going to win. Now, what hurt this a little bit was that Brian Cage, and both of them actually were a little slow to kick out on a few of the near falls. So it made a... Uh, you know, it made the ref look like he was counting slow. So that was my only real complaint about it. But 
I think my favorite was uh, Matt Seidel jumped off the top rope to do whatever. Brian Cage catches him like in a suplex position and is going to do the drill claw. But then Matt Seidel rolls him up. I mean, they really did. They really played this, you know, small guy versus big guy thing very well. Matt Seidel never acted like a cowardly heel during this. And that's what I really like with Impact right now. The heels are not afraid of the baby faces. It's, I hate that when you see a, a wrestling show where someone who's been a, a like career baby face turns heel. And then the next episode, he's, you know, hightailing it out of there, running from the, it, it's ridiculous. Matt Seidel never ran from Brian Cage. And it didn't come across like big guy versus small guy. To me, it kind of came across as, as two people who were, you know, equal. And my, Matt Seidel was a great champion. And I don't know if you saw this. He's revoking his rematch clause. Brian Cage does win this. He's revoking his rematch clause this Thursday on Impact. I know you're highly critical about the rematch clause because some people get it, some don't. You know, uh, the knockouts never get it. <laughs> so... um <laughs> What do you got on a uh, Brian Cage versus Matt Seidel? I'll say this: my opinion changed because you know I had been consistent with I thought that Brian Cage, I would you know I thought he should be challenging for the world title. Well, not challenging for the world title, but wrestling more in the heavyweight division side of things. But I think in moving forward, I feel good about him working the X division because I think it, he showed in this match like. I would have never in a million years thought Seidel would have gotten as much as offense that he did was able to get in this match. And those counters, like there was one he had, I want to say he got him for the drill claw. And there's one where he uh, got a Rana out of it. He reversed it into a Rana. And it was just, and then he was able to hit, he hit some type of, um, I don't know if it's like an angle slammer. I, I don't know what it was. But the point that I'm just trying to make is, I th Brian Cage did enough, or the way that they designed this match, they did it enough where it gave Seidel a, punchy, a puncher's chance. Even though in our heart of hearts we knew Brian Cage was walking out champion, or at least most pe people felt that way, it wasn't one of those things where he just went, ran, went in there and just ran through Seidel. They made it an honest enough match where it looked like he had a shot. So I think moving forward, him in the X Division... I think it'll be fine as long as they lay the matches out where these guys that are much, much smaller than him, they make it somewhat believable that they have a, an honest chance against him. Yeah, you him. know, at, at uh, Redemption, you know, there was that opening six-way match with a bunch of X Division guys and Brian Cage, and we thought he was just going to throw people around all match, and it was a competitive match. Brian Cage won like we expected. I personally have no problem with Brian Cage in the X Division. You know, everyone... He's not a cruiserweight. He's not a lightweight. This should be like 205 live. Like, they don't owe us any. This their division. They created his division. They create the rules. Not us. Not the fans. You know, and the X division at this point needs to be a mid-card title because we don't have one. Now, if they introduce one later, you know, maybe you play by those rules a little bit. But, you know, right now, that's, that's all we got. So, if people can't uh wrestle for the world title they got to wrestle for something and right now they're bringing in a lot of guys yeah. who are more um in ring savvy and could probably work the x division style if necessary you know i can see even a, even a point where sammy callahan is wrestling there yeah I, I i thought about that i think you know even at least from my opinion i think the reason why i had always felt it was a cruiserweight division is if you look back the history this stems back to when they were associated with uh nwa Outside of Samoa Joe and then later on Abyss, most of the guys that had, were champion were cruiserweights. Like, they were guys that it had WCW still been around, they'd be in the cruiserweight division. So even though at during that time it was treated like a mid-card belt, the only people who were winning it were essentially cruiserweights. But then the one thing I've started to realize, too, with Impact and one thing they've been able to do, they really don't pigeonhole anybody. That now you might have guys, like we look at somebody like Austin Aries, who, yeah, should, could be uh, uh, competing in the cruiserweight division, you know, multiple uh, former X Division champion. But, you know, if you got what it takes to mix it up in the main event and, you know, people will, go, people will buy you as that main event talent, they're giving people a shot. So... I think that, like, this match, it kind of opened my eyes a little bit, and I could see them expanding some, and I could see them having a Sammy Callahan. Um, I mean, I don't know who else after that, but, you know, I could see them starting to branch out a little bit because, like you said, not everybody can challenge for the world title, and we don't want no scenario where it becomes hot potato with the world title. 
Definitely not. And if you think back at, you know, you know, the GW1 loves to show us AJ Styles. You know, AJ Styles started winning the X Division. Like, you should work your way up. So, I feel like they're kind of going that route with Brian Cage. It could be very easy to throw the title on him tomorrow. And I'm sure... Um, I'm sure they're they, they really want to, and they're they're really fighting themselves. Uh, Dixie would have had the title on him before he even made a debut. <laughs> before he signed the so, contract, I, I will say. Yeah, I will say they just my only fear, and I hope they don't go this route. I'm sure we're gonna get a couple of big shows coming up. You know, this buy us time until we hit Bound for Glory. I just don't want them to put the exhibition title on Brian Cage only for him to invoke the option C. And and challenge for the world title. I, I hate when they do that cash in with the X Division Championship. I thought the first time when they had Austin Aries do it, like that was fine. But then you know you see everyone doing it, and I feel like it devalues the title. Agreed. I guess there's there's a way of doing it, but now with this new X Division title, it's a way to start f uh, fresh. So hopefully they don't go that route. Speaking of titles, next match on the card is the Knockouts championship match Sue Young versus Madison Rain. So this was one of the match pe matches people were down on a little bit. I wasn't really down on it. Um was it, you know, crisp was it uh, maybe not, you know, but this match actually had heat behind it. Um it started off very manufactured, you know, the way that they threw Madison Rain in there. People were like, "Why is she in this title match?" And by the end of it it ended up being a great build. And, they, you know, they played into Sue Young playing mind games with Madison Rain. And those mind games did come into play with the match, you know, namely with, with the undead bridesmaids that walked up. I actually found it hilarious when the two walked up. So she was going to go for Cross Rain, which I'm convinced Josh Matthews calls it that. And that's not the name. But she was going for it. And then the undead's bridesmaids come up and she kicks them off the apron and they just drop. Like... <laughs> It's like a playing a, a regular Nintendo video game when you're a kid and someone just walks up, you know, they're not really going to do anything to you. You just kick them and they just fall down <laughs> and they don't get back up. They don't even try to get out of the way. So I actually thought that was hilarious, but I, I love the overall presentation of the match. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't supposed to be a technical match, you know? So I thought the story they told was on point. I thought it, it, it you know, I thought it, had a purpose and it, it um and it reached that. Sue Young retains a title, which I really felt that she was going to. I think it's necessary to give her a long title run because if you take the title off her, off that character right now, so early, what the hell do you do with her going forward? So I really like the Undead Brides. Um, I like the coffin. I don't think she's copying the Undertaker. Her character is nothing like him. You know, just because there's a coffin, like people. People are so quick. Wrestling's been around for decades. Like people are so quick that they see one singular thing that reminds them of another wrestler and all of a sudden he's a knockoff. Today I heard that Brian Cage was a knockoff of Brock Lesnar. Like what? So um Sue Young wins this thing. The the bridesmaids get involved. They just stood there. The other one stood there the whole match on the ramp. I thought they were going to turn around and leave. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it was kind of funny. I actually like the finish of this. I like the way that she was able to get the mandible claw in and get the, uh, the tap out. And then they pretty much write Madison rain off TV, putting her in a coffin and probably never to be seen again on impact wrestling. She lost the world's, the ROH, the, I guess I should say the WOH, uh, women's title match. Lost the knockouts titles match, so she went 0 for two. I feel like I had a better record than Madison Rain this weekend. <laughs> Straight up, but she went she went 0 for two, and I, I guess we never really took into consideration. Maybe you know Sue Young was going to write her off television, write her out of the company, and it actually furthered her character and made her stronger because it's like, oh damn, she just damn near buried. She's put three knockouts in a row in a coffin. One of them is supposedly dead. Uh, Ali Ali resurrected if you want to compare anyone to the Undertaker and um, Madison Rain will probably never see again it's kind of like when Sienna came and she she ended the career of uh, Velvet Sky you know and I and I want to say she had a something similar with someone else too but you know it gives it gives something to give Sue Young a backstory in the company 
So tell me what your thoughts were of the knockouts title match. You know, the highlight for me was just the finish. I thought having Su Young win with, I think she calls it the purge. I thought that was an excellent way to give her a win. And then to have her bury Madison Rain. now that I come to think of it, because it's been rumored. Um, I forgot the source that I seen it was cite, but that maybe Madison Rain is going to be competing for that that young whatever what you you probably know better May yeah young classic oh, my bad um so the thing i would say i, I like the fact that it seems like with su young's gimmick you know after i guess whatever feuds she has she's uh putting them in the coffin but what they have to do with certain individuals obviously if it's people that are you know going to stay on the roster got to keep them off tv at least you know more than a couple weeks just to sell that they've been buried but uh, yeah, I, I like this, and I think this helps Sue Young's character moving forward. I'm glad this was the outcome because, you know, there was a part of me just thinking, you know, sometimes the, this company can't help themselves, and you know, they gotta go against the grain and and do do the opposite of what's actually, you know, makes sense. And um, I'm glad they didn't go that route, and they decided to have Sue Young retain. I think Sue Sue Young's such a great character. Uh, Bully Ray tweeted out Sue Young in a in a money bag, and I think she is money. Um, I say build Sue Young as strong as humanly possible until Rosemary returns, and we're gonna have something insane. The way that all these theatrics and cinematics and all that stuff, the way that they're they're telling stories right now, imagine Sue Young and Rosemary doing something like that. What did you think? Uh, Cause you know, we didn't talk about the last episode of impact. What did you think about Madison rain seeing her own funeral? Like it, like it actually came to fruition. That's the crazy thing. It wasn't just a mind game. Like she really ended up in the damn coffin. I thought it was just an excellent way to sell the match. Cause I, I don't know for me, this feud, it, it seemed like it started on a little bit late. Cause we had seen with the whole push with Madison rain, you know, she went through, well, well, she went through two people, but, you know, she had three matches before she actually started interacting with Sue Young. But I thought what they did, you know, prior to Slammiversary, that was a great way to sell sell the match. So, um, but yeah, I, I really just like this for Sue Young. And I think because that, that's the one thing we never got and not to try to look too much deep into it, but we never really kind of got an explanation as why is she the undead bride? You know, normally with something like that, you get some mini backstory. Maybe she got left at the altar and something happened. We never got that. But, I mean, at least now the thing we can play off with is, you know, she's buried Rosemary and she buried Madison Rain. You know, she thought she had buried Allie, but Allie got away. Like, so there's something there. And I think that's going to help her moving forward. Next match on the card. This is when things started getting real, real interesting. LAX versus the OGs. This was the one I got wrong. And again, it's I was confused with the uh, the world title. Uh, I mean, sorry, with the tag team titles, whether they're on the line or not. At first, I didn't think Hernandez and, and uh, Homicide looked too good. I was a little worried with the opener. This ended up going balls to wall. LAX came. What, what do they call that when they have the uh, that face paint on? Uh, I don't know. It just it reminded me of that movie, uh, Dead Presidents. Dead Presidents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know th they came out, and uh, it was excellent. Didn't a homicide have a Slammiversary T-shirt on? <laughs> I didn't even I didn't even catch it. Catch that part. <laughs> I, I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure he did. Uh, it reminds me of like Tommy Dreamer when uh, during the Eddie and and uh, Sammy fighting in the woods, he gets out of the car with the Lucha Underground shirt. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I believe he had one though, and. I I can't say enough good about the match. You know, amazing spots. There was times where you thought the match was was over. Or not so much the moves they did, but you just felt like the momentum was getting ready to lead, lead to a finish. And then the match would kind of continue. And this was one I really wanted to continue because I was like, D I, I want them to keep going. Like, at this point, I don't care who wins. Of course, there was concern that if the OGs lost, where does it go? You know, is it a one-off? Are they done? You know, is it like Undertaker versus Undertaker? He, the, you know, the, the clone loses and we never see him again. So I was, you know, there was concern with that. It looks like the OGs are here to stay. The, 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 the match was great. It was hardcore. And even though LAX gets the win, the story continues. Kingston comes in. 
they uh they beat these guys down with straps they they even uh conan took a strap and and uh you know uh homicide not homicide but hernandez was you know he was giving up some pretty weak stomps there but you know conan is someone who's had hip hip replacement surgery and everything you do got to be careful with him a little bit but the match continues uh, sometimes you got to read between the lines. Straps were involved. Maybe a strap match is next, you know, because once you have a 51 50 street fight, you can't just have a regular tag team match next. It has to keep going. Uh, very similar to this, could be very similar to the OVE and LAX thing. And we might even get a barbed wire massacre. Who knows? Uh, that would be pretty cool, but we don't want to get too much of that. Uh, maybe we get a monster's ball with Abyss as the guest referee. I'm kidding. But. The story is going to continue. That's the really exciting thing about all this. So um, what were your thoughts about this match overall? And let me start by asking you, were you disappointed that we got no Diamante? You know, well, when I didn't see anyone interfere on, hell, even King being ringside didn't interfere. But when I didn't see anybody interfere on the OGs in, I kind of expected, well, you know, there's probably no point to seeing Diamante. Uh, I don't understand. It seems like as a late since she's returned from her injury, like she has a loose association with them, uh, with uh, LAX. You know, we see her when she's skeptical of King. And then, you know, I think we see her one more time and then that's it. So, you know, I, they really got to find something for her. I mean, especially when we talk about the knockouts, you know, why isn't she, you know, trying to challenge in the knockouts division? You already got the te- uh LAX is already the tag team champions. Usually when you have these stables, you know, everybody's trying to collect gold. So I'll be, I'll, I'll be interested to see what they do with her. As far as this match, I want to say by far the match of the night for me. I really think, before I even dive in, I think Santana's going to be a star. Um, hopefully it's not something anytime soon that they decide to break LAX up. But whenever they decide to do, that guy's going to be a star for the company. He just has has that it. I mean, you know, and, and Ortiz did well in this too. And, you know, credit to the OGs. I was skeptical about how they'd be able to deliver just given their advanced age. But this really, you know, they both put on – both teams put on an excellent match and now the food st- is going to continue ju- you know judging by the post-match angle so yeah I, I don't know what match they can do next i was trying to think back i know they did one uh with team 3d a while back it's the the name of it's uh i can't can't grip it but i'm interested to see what what type of match they do next but this is far from over obviously there were some uh, holy shit moments in this, you know, homicide diving to the outside, then Hernandez jumping over the top. I mean, these guys just went all out. You knew they were, you knew LAX was going to the couple pay-per-view matches they've had. They've been insane. They've, uh, they've gone all out. So you knew this was going to happen. It's always seems like LAX is in these street fights and these gimmick matches. You know, it, it just seems like that's always where they go with it, but maybe, maybe that fits the, the gimmick. I mean, they're supposed to be from the streets, So, but this was excellent. Uh, it was my number two match. My number one match of the night was Sammy Callahan versus Pentagon Jr. This was brutal. It was bloody. It was ugly. They were all over the place. There was chairs. There was tables. I think there were tables. Uh, but there was chairs. There was uh, you know, metal spikes. Sammy even tried to rip the mask off. He said, hey, I'm going to take this off now. You know, if I win, that's that's just a consolation prize. I'm taking the mask off now. Again, compare how Sammy Callahan le- left this to how Eddie Edwards left it. You know, Eddie Edwards, they could have probably uh, made him the number one contender very easily for Aries after this. But I think he did take a step back. Sammy, tell- Sammy Callahan took steps forward. And uh, just, I-, I thought the match was just amazing. It was flawless. I think the only real real complaint about I didn't really care about OVE running in real quick. I mean, they should. They both had broken arms. I think my only complaints were when uh, Pentagon. I think he hit the package pile driver or Pentagon driver. I don't know what he went for um, on top of the chairs. Like I thought that should have been the end of the match. There were some really good near falls, and I'm all about that. But that was pushing it a little bit for me. However, when Johnny Bravo got his arm broken. I freaking thought that was great. Uh, Just that Pentagon was blind. Right when he's blinded, you think, oh shit, he's going to lose the match. 
but they turned that into getting his hands on the referee. Johnny Bravo is a wrestler on the independent circuit in uh, BCW. So, you know, he can take a move like that. That's why at uh, LU versus Impact, you saw, I forgot who it was, toss him over the top rope. <laughs> like it was a battle royal. You know, he can, he can take spots like that. He is a wrestler. So that was just great. And um, the, the match, the, the ending ended up being good. I wasn't real big on Sammy no selling the the broken arm. There was a moment where they you because of a bad camera angle you could see uh Johnny Bravo, you know, he Sammy tried to pick him up and he had to fall and brace himself with his quote unquote bad arm. Uh so that was that was some bad ring awareness, but you know, he completely no sold it and uh that's why I wish that wasn't the end of the match. I, I wish they would have done it with the table spot, but Pentagon wins. Huge emotional moment. The head shaving. I was thinking Scroll was going to come out at this point too. I, that's always how I thought. I was like, Sammy's going to try to take off and Marty Scroll is going to chase him back. That's what I thought. That would have been pretty huge. Because um, at first he acted like he was going to let him cut his hair. and But it was Phoenix. And that that's fine. Makes all the sense in the world. Shaves his head. He's crying during it. What do you got on this one? No, first off, I had and I had tweeted this. I said that lets you know what the company thinks of Sammy Callahan that this match got the slot before the main event. You know, he, Sammy Callahan's been big time for Impact. He's been a good get this whole year. So, yeah, as far as the match, um, I love the spot of the referee uh, Johnny Bravo getting his arm broken. You know, normally. You know, you see the typical ref bump where they're in the way and they get hit. And that was a creatively done. And then I like, too, that towards the end, well, after the match, obviously, once it was decided, they teased that Sammy Callahan was going to get in bolt, a bolt out of dodge. So, I, you know, it kind of left you wondering, like, oh, dang, so he lost the match. He's not going to get his hair cut. Then, obviously, we get Phoenix there. But overall, man... I mean, I don't know what, I, what what more I can say. I mean, just back and forth. It just seems like they plug Sammy Callahan, and this is—I know this is his second big feud, but and he just makes it work. And even though he's zero and two with these few, in these feuds, I mean, it doesn't hurt him at all. And uh, Pentagon, the the way that they've presented Pentagon now, it's unfortunate they weren't able to do this while he was champion. It seems like more now we're kind of getting to see more what or as far as audience who aren't too familiar with his work in lucha underground who are seeing him now you know we're kind of getting more acquainted with him and you know he's a big deal so you know that he you know it was great on his end as well but yeah this this this, this was one of them it was it was it was some nice stuff so if you thought eddie edwards snapped i can only imagine sammy callahan will be taking his character to the next level I don't know who they can feud him with next. Uh, maybe they, they find a way to keep it going with Pentagon a little bit. You know, obviously Phoenix gets involved. He's got OVE by his side. I'm sure Sammy's not going to show up for a couple episodes. OVE surely won't. And, you know, maybe Pentagon gets a third partner and it kind of turns into a six-man ordeal. Seems like that would be going backwards a little bit, but we'll see. Very interesting to see. I just can't wait to see what's next for Sammy because I know he's, he's going to deliver. He's going to kill it. Main event of the evening, Moose challenges Austin Aries for the Impact World title. I have been saying this for as long as I can remember, that pro wrestling has lost its ability to create the big fight feel for the main event. Boy, did they ever, ever pull it off this time around. We, we've, we've you know spoken quite a bit about the build with the video packages, keeping their hands off each other. But was that going to lead up to a big fight feel? Big, big moment? I thought so. I thought the match, just like I said, I thought it over-delivered. This is an example of what I always say about under-promise, over-deliver. They never said, hey, this is going to be the biggest world title match you'll ever see. you know. And this really was one of the best world title matches they've delivered in, in quite some time. They just they kept it low pro. And they both of these guys killed it. Moose looked great. I could have bought Moose winning this match. I really could have. You know, throwing Aries into the crowd, uh, the stuff they did on the outside with the brain buster on the outside. And there was another spot right before that that was pretty insane, too. But I, I thought these guys laid it all on the line. They had the Bruce Buffer type announcer, Curtis Granderson with the belt. It, it felt big fight feel to me. It felt main event. The crowd was into it. And I've got no complaints about this match 
I thought it was the third best match on the card. And I, I felt I felt from a very early time in this build, even though we didn't like the match when it was announced and how they selected him as the number one contender, I really had a feeling this match was going to deliver. I really feel that it did. Uh, Moose did not win. But the one thing, you know, um, my boy Liam, I covered this on the channel, wrote an article about Moose winning in defeat. This, I think Moose moves to the next level now. I, th I think he went to the next level. Obviously, still got to work on the promos, things like that. But uh, I, I think Moose Moose took the next step. And I think you got a very sympathetic loss here. You know, I, I think we're all bigger fans of Moose after the match. I think the worst thing they can do after this is give him the title on a uh, taped episode of Impact down the road where everyone knows it's coming. I think I think when Moose gets that title win, I, I do think it needs to be a pay-per-view or some kind of live episode. But after that big fight feel... You know, they, he can't just get it in a throwaway match later down the road. Uh, what do you think about the main event? Yeah, you know what? Moose showed that he could belong, that he belongs in the main event. I think I thought this was kind of like a trial for him in a sense. And um, I was impressed by Austin Aries because the whole time I watched this match, I'm like, there's no way in hell he's going to be able to hit the brain buster on him. Not only he was able to hit it on him, he was able to do it twice. So, uh, and, you know, Austin Aries did his thing as well. I was surprised by the finish only because I thought you could do more with Moose as champion than you could do with Austin Aries only because since you look at the company right now, we only got really two, you could say, main event baby faces and, you know, everything else is really hill heavy. So then that's what it had me wondering, too. I was just like, it wouldn't make if they were going to do the title change, they should have done it now because I was wondering, like, if they have one of these uh, special shows, you know, I, I don't know what would be next. And if they decide to do it there, um, you know, it'd been better served to do it on pay-per-view. But with that said, I've been a firm believer. Whenever they decide to put the world title on Moose, I don't think it's going to be a long reign. So I think had he won here at, at Slammiversary, I think he would have lost it between now and Bound for Glory. I, 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 it doesn't uh, it doesn't strike me as somebody that's going to help hold the belt that long. You know, nothing against him. I just don't, you know, just don't see that. And, you know, the one thing, and not to get too much off a of topic, you know, the one thing I've noticed with Impact, if you look at a lot of the champions, there's not too many multiple former champions. You think about it, when somebody loses the belt, like, that's pretty much it, and they move on. I mean, you, you look at someone like Austin Aries, LAX, um, I think, Comes to mind. I know she's uh, you know not currently wrestling with the company right now, but you know there's only a, those are the only couple of people who are multiple time champions. It seems like a lot of people once they win the title or should I say lose the title, they're kind of out of the title picture. So that's something that down the road I'd love to see them be able to do and give us some long reigns with some people because I I think you've stated that what the long the current longest Impact World Champion is what is Bobby Roode, right? Yeah. So, you know, maybe, it, you know, if you don't have anyone in mind that, you know, you're ready to take that next step, you know, maybe give Austin Aries that opportunity. I mean, I don't know. Uh, but I was just surprised, though, because I just wonder who's the next challenger now. I guess you can get, pump out one more match out of Moose and Austin Aries. But assuming Moose comes up short again, then, you know, who else is there to, for him to face babyface wise? I think it's important to have a bunch of a roster of wrestlers who may only have one title run or title reign or or none. And I almost went through this whole podcast without name dropping WWE, but I'm going to do it real quick because I, I need it to make my point. It seems like everyone on that roster, they, they're buying into the, the social issues of everybody gets a participation trophy. You can go up and down that roster unless you you know just came to the, the, the main roster, or whatever. Everyone's had a title. You know, even those douchebags, uh, I think they're called the B team or something, the tag team champions right now, two jobbers. You know, <laughs> everybody holds a title for them. So so they literally, they mean nothing. And it means nothing. There's no passion when they win it. There's no passion when, you know, the Zigglers and Mizzes win their umpteenth intercontinental titles. Who the fuck cares? You know, yeah. so when, when a guy like Moose kind of get finally gets that win, um, the way we felt when Eli Drake won as fans, uh, not so much the crowd because it was, it was Orlando, you know, going up and down like yeah, it's going to mean something when these guys win a title. And it's going to mean something when, when they hold the title. I agree. Moose, he'll win it. I don't think he'll carry it for a long time. 
Uh, I know his goal is to be the longest reigning champion. He said that on our interview with Adam. That's definitely not going to happen. I could, I'll, uh, I'll bet anything on that. But uh, Moose showed he belonged. And um, now he just needs to take the next step promo-wise. We didn't get a, like a D'Angelo De- um, interference or anything. He, he played his role in the episode of Impact perfectly. You know, he's, he's pretty much out there as the messenger. And, and just the, the main event was great. So I asked you at the very beginning what you gave it. You said a uh, nine. I, I give about a 8.5, you know, maybe a nine. This I, I just really didn't enjoy that House of Hardcore match. Uh, you know, I guess I would have been okay with the match had the finish just told a better story, you know, other than just, all right, well, here's here's the kendo stick, passing the torch, good luck. I, I wasn't feeling it, not even for a second, but... Overall, phenomenal pay per view. Um, the Ryan Satins of the world, the the Bubba or the Bully Rays, um, all these guys stepping up, saying great show. You know, uh, Jim Ross did, Chris Jericho, so some big guys with some big followings. Even the Iron Sheik said, "Good job," you know, Bubba, whatever, whatever the fuck language he uses. Uh, just a great pay per view, and. Um, this was make or break. They had to deliver. They had to for Slammiversary. We, we can't, we couldn't push it off again till Bound for Glory. They had to deliver. And now the bar is set high. I think the set of tapings will be off the charts, but the bar is set very high for Bound for Glory. Any closing comments on the show? Yeah, just real quick, you know, shout out to the Canada crowd. I actually seen Jimmy out there <laughs> and uh, seen him uh, representing. Um, the crowd really m- helped make this show excellent, too, because they were just, you know, from the Impact Wrestling chance to just, you know, everything else as far as in the matches, they were fully engaged. And I think that's kind of something that's been missed in Impact. So credit them. I will say this, it just closing out. And I, I get what you're saying, and stuff, and I've learned to understand, like, you have to understand uh, some of these people who have these big followings, you know, they kind of have, you know, they're the voice of the people for some. So what they say, people are going to follow that. The thing that I just annoyed me a little bit was seeing all impacts, most detractors, you know, who normally criticize every little thing they do, want to give praise. And then all of a sudden, oh, well, let me watch again. You know, finally, I'm going to give it a chance. Like, you know, we don't impact doesn't need the pity. You know, they they put are putting on a product. You know, they understand the 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 bad history or some of the bad history that the company's had, and they're trying to rewrite that. You know, Rome wasn't built overnight. You know, it took time. And what they've been doing all this year is just giving us impact fans first. You know, the things that we want. You know, uh, what's the word I want to use? You know, easy easy to watch programming. You know, storyline. You know, storylines that make sense. You know. D- matches delivering all all of those things and you know, they gave us a network all these different things and stuff and i i don't know it's just it just annoys me to hear you know see someone all of a sudden you know who trash it hey you know i've shitted on impact but you know what you should watch it oh okay yeah yeah we should watch it because such and such said it like that's why when you had said like i know some people don't care like i don't care what bully ray solo monster all of that those guys don't mean shit to me because if i'm gonna watch something my, I go by my eye test, you know, and if it's something that's good, because there's times that they can tell you something's good and it's ass, you know, and, and, and you know, I, and that's when I, I, I'm able to, I guess all I'm just trying to say is I, I think more people, they need to be able to make an opinion for themselves. You have to understand sometimes, and even with us, when we review the product, you know, there's going to be times that people don't necessarily agree with us, and that's okay. We're not looking for people to necessarily agree with us. We're just giving our opinion, and we we welcome people to give theirs. And I, I just kind of wish people would be able to tune into some of these podcasters who might be negative towards certain things. And see for themselves to see if they can relate to it versus, oh, well, I heard what such and such said and, you know, such and such said it was trash. So, yeah, it's trash. Then someone else sees it's trash. Yeah, it's trash. And then it becomes a big old group thing like, yeah, it's trash. Very well said. Good uh, closing statement. Last thing I want to I want to say the Moose trying to hit the spear and then uh, Austin turning it out to the last last chancery was really a cool, a cool spot. Good moment. So. Thanks for listening. For Row, I am BQ. Please subscribe to the Impact Lounge. We do this each and every week. Talk to you soon. Peace.